Welcome, everyone. All right, I think we are good to go from what I can tell. Yeah, okay, we're gonna go for it. Um, so um, I want to give everybody a warm welcome to the continuation of Bioconductor 2021. This has been a really phenomenal event so far. My name is Stephanie Hicks, and I am honored and excited to be chairing this keynote session. This afternoon, we are extremely happy to have with us a truly inspiring individual, Gabriela de Quiros. Um, she has an incredible story, and I have dropped some links in the chat with some of the initiatives that I'm about to mention. Gabriela is originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where she originally started to study electrical engineering, but fell in love with statistics after spending a semester in the US. She completed her bachelor's in statistics um, from State University of Rio de Janeiro and went on to complete her master's in epidemiology and another one in statistics um, at California State University. Gabriela is now a chief data scientist and senior machine learning engineer manager at IBM in San Francisco, managing a team of open source developers around AI and open source ecosystems within IBM. I first became familiar with Gabriela through her um, initiative our Ladies. If you are not familiar with Our Ladies, it is a worldwide organization for promoting diversity in the R community with more than 200 chapters in 55 uh, more, more than 55 countries. And actually three years ago, um, she is the one that inspired me to co-found a local Our Ladies chapter in my town that I live in Baltimore, Maryland. She is also the founder of AI Inclusive, a global organization that's helping increase the representation and participation of gender minorities in AI. And some other incredibly notable awards and achievements from Gabriella include she's uh, she received the People's Choice Manager Excellence Award at IBM. She was a finalist for the Woman in Open Source Award by Red Hat, and she is a member of the R Foundation that promotes um, that provides support to the continued development of R. Um, she was the first Latinx member and the sixth woman uh, globally to be elected. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Gabriela de Quiroz, who will be talking about building a diverse community, the Our Lady story. Gabriela, the stage is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. It's such a pleasure to be here talking to you all and having you as introducing myself. Um, I want to say thank you again for the invite. Thank you again for being here. And let me start sharing my screen and we can kick off the session. So. All right, my slides should be coming up. There we go. Um, so again, my name is Gabriela de Queiroz. I work at IBM as a chief data scientist. And below there are some, some of my contacts if you are interested in getting in touch and talking to me, I'm always available, available to talk further. So uh, today I wanna talk about the Our Ladies story uh, building the diverse community. And I'll go through some of the stories, some of the challenges, a lot of pieces around the Our Ladies. Um, so what is Our Ladies? Not everybody is aware or knows what Our Ladies is. Uh, so Our Ladies uh, is a worldwide organization that promotes, promotes diversity in the art community via meetups, in mentorship, in a friendly and safe environment. So that's our mission, our goal, our vision of the community, the Our Ladies organization. But then also a lot of people don't know how, when Our Ladies was born. So let me go back in time a little bit. A few years back, 2012, I moved from Brazil, from Rio de Janeiro to San Francisco. When I got here, I came as a student. I was coming to do my second master's and I discovered something called Meetup, meetup.com. And I was just amazed on the amount of groups and events that they hosted here in, in, in San Francisco, especially. And then I started signing up for all the events because until then, my, my knowledge, I would say, was a little bit limited. Um, I didn't know much about machine learning. I didn't know about all the buzzwords uh, around data science, big data, Hadoop, uh, even SQL. I knew a bit, but not much. Uh, so I started signing up for all these groups. 
and and then going and and I, I make a joke which is not a joke it's very true uh, as a student from coming from Latin America the dollar it's very expensive the currency right so our budget is very limited so I would go to the events to get knowledge and also because they would serve or give uh, food usually pizza that's okay but I was it was a way for me to get my dinner guaranteed uh, and not spending money for dinner so I would go to these events every night. Every night I would go to one. I would pick one and, and, and learn. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, this is all cool. And one thing that I didn't say for me, coming to San Francisco and going to the meetup scene was kind of like going to the Disneyland, right? You have all these uh, things that you can do and you look around, you are not sure what to do. And then you try to do all the way, all the, the, the round and you try again so this was me with the meetup.com scene so then i got to a point where i was like okay this is awesome i'm learning for free i'm acquiring knowledge i'm meeting new people new speakers new technology and everybody that's behind all these events they are doing this as volunteers so they are not getting paid to do this so it's all volunteer based they are there every night uh, making this available for us. So I got to, to a point where I was like, okay, this is awesome. Now it's my time to give back because I see this as a, as a cycle, right? So like you get it, you acquire, and then you give back. And then the next person will do the same, hopefully, right? So that was how I was kind of like thinking about. So then I went back home after several we weeks going to these meetups and said, you know, I should know something. I, I, I probably know something that I can share with others. And I've been using R for a while, for several years. And, and this is a CD version of my first R, R uh, version that I had installed on my computer back in the days. And th these were all the tutorials. Uh, if you learn R in, back then in the early 2000s or before that, uh, we didn't have many materials. They, these were some of the materials that we had back then. So anyway, so I was thinking, what do I know that I can share with others? And then I was like, okay, cool. I know R. I'm passionate about R. I would love to teach and share my knowledge around R. Okay, so maybe I should create an R group. But one thing that I noticed when I was going through these meetups is that first, I would see myself in the corner not interacting much, maybe because I was a woman, maybe because I was a foreign, and because I didn't feel welcome, and I didn't feel safe, and it was not like a good place. I, I didn't feel like it was a good place for me, or I was very, I don't know, ashamed or, or, or shy. Uh, and then the majority of people going to these meetups, they were white male. So I said, okay, I like her, I know her, and I want to have something better than what we have right now. I want to have a place where we could all feel welcome and safe without judgment. So then that's how Our Ladies was born. So that was the first logo of Our Ladies back in 2012. I created this Google site website, very vintage, uh, but it was, it was a jam, I would say. So in 2012, October, in San Francisco, our first event was hosted. It was an introduction to R, more uh, tailored toward beginners and pre-beginners. And I was very excited. I was so excited to be launching this first event. I put together a presentation and I got a, a nice place to host us. Uh, and I was ready to go. I launched the meetup.com, our ladies website, and then the day arrived. When the day arrived, only eight people showed up. I was so disappointed. I was like, no, 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 no. This is not correct. This is not right. I'm here teaching R, which is awesome. It's free. We have dinner and the venue, it's amazing. Why only eight people showed up? In the end of the presentation, someone came to me and said, you know, Gabriella, I know that you are frustrated, you are disappointed, 
but do you know what is happening outside? And I'm like, what? Well, Halloween, so it's Halloween. Everybody in San Francisco is celebrating and it's the, in the streets, partying. And like, you were lucky that eight people showed up. So that was the first lesson learned. Never again host a meetup in a Halloween night. So since then, a lot of things happened. So the first chapter that we call was based in San Francisco, but then we had three other chapters that came after. So the second one was in Taipei, Taiwan. The third one was in Twin Cities. And, and the fourth one, uh, it was in London. Then USR was approaching June 2016. So it's been four years since Our Ladies was born. Uh, people knew about Our Ladies. Uh, we were invited to talk about Our Ladies at USR 2014 and then 2016. So then during that time, uh, I met with the London organizers and we saw that after the presentation on the stage, people would come to us and, and ask, how can we replicate this amazing community in our city? And then it got me thinking, well, we don't have an infrastructure to replicate or to spread the news around the Our Ladies. So long, short, long, long story short, San Francisco and London, the two groups, we got together and then we created the Our Ladies Global. So now we have a team, now we have an infrastructure. And during that time, during the USR, we got to know about something called our consortium. And they were open, uh, they were, um, they were uh, opening for, for submissions, right? So then we got together and we are like, okay, why don't we apply to get funding so we can get this plan out of the paper. So then we applied to the Art Consortium funding and we were awarded 10,000. And the main idea was to establish additional Art Ladies group all over the world. So Art Consortium is a Linux Foundation project and they have like several awards throughout the year. And there are several projects that came out of this program. So our main goals when we apply to the funding we had like three main goals. The first one was to create this brand, the Our Ladies brand. The second one was to create a centralized infrastructure. And then we thought, okay, with all that, we can expand to more or less five to 10 cities in the next year. So then we created the Our Ladies Global Twitter account with the logo, with purple, you know, all the, the the brand guidelines. We created a website where we had all the chapters um, located with all the event, events happening around the globe. And then we also created something very interesting, which is the Our Ladies directory. And why did we create that? So we were kind of like tired of like listening people to saying to us, you know, the all male panels, for example, and they would come and say, oh, we couldn't find any women or gender minority or in the, any underrepresented population to come and speak. And we're like, what? How come not? Okay, let's create a directory. So now you don't have the excuse that you cannot find people. So we created this All Ladies directory during that time as well. We put in place a code of conduct in two, three different languages. We created a GitHub where not only we would store uh, documents and materials around the Our Ladies Global Organization, but also each group would have a folder there so they could use during their events as well. So during that time from 2016, since the funding, to August uh, 2017, uh, we went from four chapters and then end of 2016 to 21 new chapters, so in total 25 chapters. And then in mid-2017, we went to 56 chapters, so 30 new chapters. Uh, so in the end of 2017, we were over 60 chapters. 
So then we are like, okay, we were beyond our predictions. So the money is running low. We need to go through another round. What we are going to do, we need more infrastructure because the main money, what people don't realize because we use meetup.com, Meetup.com is very expensive. So the money that I would say 95%, 99% of the money would go to pay Meetup fees. So we decide to make a new proposal for funding through the same R consortium. So we made a new prediction and we say, you know, by 2018, we would have 65 chapters, by 2019, 100, and so on. And then for each, year we would asking for money so then they said okay this is a huge project that it's very important to the community let's move our ladies to become a top level which means that our ladies would get a three-year support so we would not have to be um, asking for money every year we would have this long-term support so that was a huge deal for us so then we things exploded Throughout the years, the, the chapters were growing and growing and growing until May 2019. Looking back, we were already in 47 countries and almost 160 cities with more than 47,000 members and thousands and thousands of events all over the world. And if you want to get a, a, a distribution example on geographically, so that's how things would look like in a map. So a lot of chapters in the US, a lot of chapters, chapters in Latin America, a lot of chapters in Europe, chapters in Africa, Asia, Australia, and so on. That was May 2019. So then let's fast forward 2021, which where we are right now. So these numbers are updated to yesterday. So now our ladies is in 58 countries in more than 200 cities with over 93,000 members. So it's huge if you look back from 2019 to 2021, or even if you look back from 2016 to now, or 2012 to now, right? So it's a huge um, growth, but it's more than numbers, right? And then when we talk about Usually when you talk about our, everybody mentions about our ladies, this amazing community that you should be aware of, right? One of the questions I used to get asked and I still get asked, we all get asked all the time is like, how do you think that the organization changed the landscape of the art project? Because we see people talking about it, we see numbers, but like, how do you see this change? And I always say the following, it's very hard to measure this type of impact. Very, very, very hard. We know from personal stories um, to uh, things that are out there in the media, but it's very hard to measure the impacts. So to show you an example, there was a survey a few years back where one of the questions was, what is the best aspect of working with R? And then they did this, uh, kind of like word cloud, you can see that the community, it was a free form text, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you see that the community was the most um, written or, or said word in this survey. So that's a, good, a very good proxy of the impact of the R ladies in the R community, in the R project. Another thing that I like, I always like to show is like, Let's just see the pictures. Let's just go see who is creating packages, who is attending the conferences. And here I got some pictures uh, so we can have an idea what is before and after. So this is a picture on the top. It's a picture of Use R 2013. And then at the bottom is a get together of our ladies only uh, in 2019. So the pictures can tell the difference, right? Another one that if you've been to our studio conference, you probably experienced this, is the art studio conference pictures that we took. So 2018, 2019, and then before the pandemic, in the beginning of the year 2020, the crowd was so huge 
that we could not fit everybody in a picture. Like if you go, like you can see that there are people all over. This is in 2020 we did, in 2019 and 18 as well, we did a, a get together after the conference and we always take a picture in the end. So you can see how many people now is attending and identify as a uh, part of the Our Ladies community. Through Our Ladies, several other kind of like branches or things happen around the world because we know that usually the technology, the knowledge, it's very centric in, in some places. Like for example, use R would be centric or centered around US and Europe. And then we went to Australia, right? So it was very North centered. Uh, and then through our ladies and through this collaboration, we went to different places like Latin America through the La uh, Latin R conference. Then the other one that was in Brazil, CER. And then we had um, different ones that I'm going to show. But nowadays we have like satellite conferences or conferences all over the world. It's not only centered in one or two places anymore. So another picture that I really like is the Our Ladies New York conference. Also, they have get togethers. Another one, uh, I didn't mention about Saturday, but Saturday, it's also another um, conference that is it's all over the world. It, it was in Africa and then in France and, and it's been around as well. And every conference we try to get together as our, our ladies, because we see that we have connection that it's so interesting, like the connection that we developed through this community. So we always get together, take pictures and share knowledge in conferences, outside conferences and so on. But yes, so all of that is amazing, but I'm sure you are asking yourself, okay, this is amazing, but you haven't talked about challenges. What are some of the challenges, for example, that you encountered and our ladies encountered when growing the community? So one of them is how do you keep this initial excitement, especially after a conference? What would happen is we, use, you, we would have a conference and right after the conference, we would have a spike of people sending us an email saying, I want to create a chapter. I want to have a chapter here in my city. I'm so excited. I met these people in, during this conference and I wanna do something in my city. So there is always this initial excitement, but it kind of like wears off after a while. So how do you keep people excited on maintaining, uh, maintaining their group, the chapter? Because we've seen that some of the groups or some of organizers, they got in touch, but they never set up the chapter. And some chapters that were active for a little bit, but then something happened and they were not active anymore. So that's a big problem for us, right? So how do we keep this excitement going? Because it is a lot of work for you to have a chapter. It's a lot of work. It's like you have to engage, you have to create tutorials, you have to create events, you have to find speakers, you have, you have to find places to host the event. So it's a lot of work and commitment. The second challenge is because it's a volunteer-based organization, how do you recruit more volunteers? Also from the Our Ladies Global Organization, it's a lot of work. It, everybody's volunteer. So how do you recruit more and more and more volunteers so you can have the organization going healthy and steady? That's another challenge. The other challenge is around money. How do you manage and then you fundraise money? That was something that we went through uh, throughout the years. Like we get this money from our consortium, but we were not a nonprofit back then. So should we use as an individual, like how do we, make, it's, it's, a, it's very complicated. So here's some of the things we did back then. So the first one was to create a buddy system where some chapters would mentor other chapters. So we would do some kind of like chapter mentoring. So if they were struggling to get started, someone more senior in the chapter leadership would come and help that organizer in the new chapter. If they don't know how to run events or not sure what to do, we would have someone helping them on the chapter uh, 
mentoring piece. The other one was because we had a lot of work, instead of like just asking people to help us, we changed or reframed a bit. We were asking now people to help with a specific task, very um, timed, um, how do I say, in, in, a, in a certain period of time, instead of like being something, oh, can you help us here? We are like, can you help on this task for the next month? Right, so people know exactly what is the commitment. And then the other thing that we did in 2018, if I, 2018 or so, no, it was 18, was to become a nonprofit. So in that way, it was easier for us to accept donation and money, et cetera. And a lot of other things. And then going back to 2019, um, I got to a point where I was like, you know, I've been with our ladies for seven years. I did a lot. It's a almost a full time job. I our ladies is in good hands. The our ladies global organization. I think it's my time to move on and do something else. So back then I was working in AI already, and I was seeing a lot of discussion around discrimination, around bias, and again. The majority of the discussions were happening in the US, especially Silicon Valley, some places in China, and that was pretty much it. And then I was thinking and thinking and thinking, and I'm like, okay, again, the knowledge is very centered. And the people who are going to be affected the most through, or because of, uh, going to be affected the most, it's going to be affected the most by these AI algorithms are going to be the communities that are not involved in the discussion. It's going to be the underrepresented communities. It's going to be the underserved communities. So I was in this state where I thought that I need to do something. And then I came up with, with, with an idea. Okay, the only way that we can reach specific communities, like underserved, underserved, underrepresented uh, minorities is to create local communities similar to what we did with our ladies. There is no way that we would get to the places where we got if it was not through the local community. So I decided to do something similar in a way. So then, end of 2019, mid to end 2019, I said, okay, I'm going to step out from our ladies, and I'm going to put my efforts, my time in this new organization called AI Inclusive. So AI Inclusive, the first piece that we are doing is bring knowledge, bring awareness, so people know and is aware of all the implications that these algorithms can cause. Because the other thing that I notice is like people think that AI is such a futuristic thing that they are it's not around you. Where I was like, yes, it is all the time. You are being watched, or you have your cell phone, someone is tracking you. So there are a lot of things that people didn't notice and they didn't know that AI was already there. So the first piece is around creating the knowledge, creating the the awareness. The second piece of the AI inclusive is like, okay, we know that the people creating those algorithms are not diverse at all. The group of people creating those algorithms are not diverse at all. So we need to empower, to find a way to empower these underserved and underrepresented communities to become empowered so they can enter into the AI field. So the second mission of our organization is to empower people so they can come and enter into the tech AI field. So, so AI inclusive, our ambition is to create the representation and participation of minority groups in AI. When I say minority groups, you are probably wondering, is there any specific on that? Any minority groups that you have in mind? And I see like this, it, the only way that we can change something is if we focus in a group first because otherwise it's very hard. So at first, our focus is on um, 
underrepresented gender minorities. So that's our main focus right now. But as we see the change, then we are going to, to move to more like broader minority groups. So if you're interested in knowing more about the AI inclusive, we have the website, we have the Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, we have a lot of things going on, events, uh, tutorials. And one of the things because of the pandemic that we had to shift because people could not go and meet in person, uh, we shift a bit. So instead of like focusing on the chapters, let's focus on opportunities. How can we give opportunities to people in an online environment? So then we had a lot of partnerships with different boot camps, schools, data science schools, AI schools, uh, to provide scholarships to our communities. So, so far, we have given more than a thousand scholarships. So we have partnered with DataQuest, R for the rest of us, Fourth Brain, and we have other partnerships coming, and I hope we can have this as an ongoing effort. Right now, we are a, a bit over one, uh, 11,000 members. Also, we are growing. And if you want to know more, if you want to be part of this community, please join us. We would love to have you by our side, helping in growing the community and making the whole AI um, space more inclusive and diverse for everybody. So I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's go for the questions. Oh, beautiful, beautiful talk. Let's give, um, let's let everybody <laughs> a round of applause through emojis. Thank you, thank you so much for that talk. And I will um, just mention to everybody, feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A tab. And while those are coming, I'll, um, I'll take the, the prerogative of um, asking the first question. So for individuals who are just starting to learn R, um, do you have advice or uh, resources that you recommend um, starting out with? I always say join the community, join one of the communities. That's the best way because learning by yourself, it's so hard. I personally, like it's so, like how many Coursera courses have I started and never finished? But because when I had someone or the group, even through the meetups, we did that. Uh, we would all finish together. So join one of the chapters, join one of the communities. That would be my my like first advice always is like join one of the communities. The other thing is like, then it also depends on if you are someone that likes to read a book and then learn from a book. So I would say that Hadley's book, uh, Data Science and R, uh, it's a book that I really like. But if you are something, if you are someone like me who likes videos or like more in interactive way, I would say there are several um, courses, online courses like the Data Quest. I really like the the interface. Uh, Coursera. We have so many of us giving courses through Coursera. That's there are so many again. Uh, I don't have one that I really really enjoy, but I, I there are a collection of them. Um, yeah, I would say there is there is a bunch. There is a bunch of resources. Nice. Thank you. Okay, so we have some questions. All right. Um, from Lucia, given that Our Ladies is a volunteer organization, does Our Ladies have a strategy to balance career advancement with volunteer activities for the members? That's a good question. I don't know at this point if they have as i mentioned i'm i stepped away from um, the strategy and what they are doing um but one thing that remember that i said that we ask for help for specific tasks that that's also like a way so you don't get overwhelmed so you can balance things because we all have also like family and we all have other things like full-time jobs but um but we don't, I don't know if we have a strategy on that. Uh, I know from my experience, I know that our ladies opened the door for me a lot. Like even through jobs that I got, uh, even for like opportunities that I got. So our ladies opened the door 
uh, in several ways. For I would say all of us uh, volunteering or working or being part of the community. Wonderful. Um, all right, a question from Michael Love. I think BioC still struggles with how to grow and recognize project leaders from outside of central labs in the US, Europe, and Australia. One aspect that you have um, to have positions where devoting so much time is allowed. Thoughts? Yes, that's a real struggle. So again, I'm going to back to my personal experience. Uh, until, until joining IBM in 2018, no company supported my work with our ladies. So it was a side, a side project always. And because I was so passionate about this, I would find time. Not easy, not, not, not easy at all, you know, because it, it is a, as I mentioned, it, it is a full-time job. Um, so having a job that, it, that uh, where you can have, you know, where they can support you, they see the value, it's so valuable and so much easier. So when I joined IBM, one of the reasons I joined IBM is because they valued the work that I was doing with our ladies and they said, you know, we do care about this work and you are going to be supported here to continue doing this work with your community. So that was essential. The other thing that I would I would like to point out is try to have a team. It's it's very very hard. Again, it's very hard to to do that by yourself. So if you can find people that are passionate, people that cares, then it becomes a little bit easier. That's really good to hear um, that you got such good support eventually. A uh, question from Debbie Day Rousseau. You mentioned that most of the funding goes to Meetup.com. What is the added value with respect um, to self-promoting via just jumped um, Twitter and similar? What is your advice for new groups that do not have funding? Well, the, the whole self-promotion it's important so people is aware, right? So that that the the the, the value of Twitter, like the first time that Hadley we come. Uh, tweeted about our ladies i was like whoa and then a lot of people who got to know our ladies so it's important to have all the different social media channels if especially if you don't have funding because funny it is a struggle as well but i have to say you can do you can do without funding it's just going to be harder in terms of infrastructure going back to ai inclusive right now i don't have any any funding uh like we had when we were going um with our ladies. So we, you kind of try to do some partnerships, for example. So maybe someone can provide pieces here and there, or some companies can partner with you and, they, and let's say they cover some basic costs that you have. Um, so that would be my other piece of advice. Um, a question from Adine. We tried to develop Bioconductor meetups, um, but Facebook events seem to be more popular in some countries. Is the R Consortium or R Ladies considering any other platform, or do others work better in certain countries? Absolutely. So, for example, Brazil, because I'm from Brazil, I'm going back to Brazil, uh, so you can see an example. In Brazil, meetup.com is still uh, popular, but there is another platform that they use that it's more, much more popular. So we try to blend. And other platforms, they are usually free. From, from my experience, only meetup.com, like the, the biggest platform, is the one that you have to pay for. So depending on the country, they don't use meetup.com because either it's blocked or because no one knows about it. So Facebook would be one. In Brazil, we use Simpla. Eventbrite could be another one. Uh, some people, they only had like a website and people would come in and they would announce the event through the, the page. So each chapter in each country, they have uh, different, let's say, technologies or ways of engaging with communities. So we do use different platforms. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I have a, another follow-up question to beginners or 
novices who are wanting to get more into data science, um, maybe they're transitioning from academia into industry, or maybe they are just wanting to go straight into industry. Do you have thoughts and recommendations on how um, resources or places to start to learning learning more about data science or AI? Or I asked you about R before, so now I'm asking you a little bit more <laughs> other specific questions. Uh, so one thing as a hiring manager, and I'm going to share, let's see if it shows up. No, it's not going to show up, but I'm going to share on the channel. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now with some of my team is going through oops, a hackathon, which it's more than a hackathon, but, but why I'm talking about this, because especially as a beginner or someone out of school or someone that is trying to transition to data science, Sometimes you don't have the portfolio or you don't have the experience that employees ask about it. So then how, what do you do? So my advice on this and suggestion, and I, as a hiring manager, I love when I see a resume with that, is start creating your portfolio. And what is a portfolio? The portfolio is, in this case, the, the most basic, I would say one. Nothing fancy. You don't have to have a fancy website. But you, you would go to get GitHub. And then even if you are at school, let's say you are taking Stephanie's class, create a repo with the material from Stephanie's class. Probably she's going to assign, give you assignments, projects, put everything there, your codes, everything. Make sure that you write a readme where you have the story, like kind of like, why are you doing this analysis? What type of analysis are you doing? What are the findings? What are the insights that you got through the analysis? So, so then the employee can see that you are able to communicate. So you can write the story. You can talk about your analysis. They can see your coding skills just going through your notebook, your R markdown. So, so that's something that we all can do. And you don't have to have work experience. You can start from school and you can decide projects, for example, and everything you can add there. Why well, I'm talking about the hackathon, because the hackathon, this hackathon uh, that we are hosting, which you can sign up now for free, we provide not only mentorship around AI technologies, but we provide data sets. We have like several webinars. You are going to have access to several technologies, IBM technologies, um, so it's a good way for you to also use the hackathon as a way to create this portfolio. So it's another um, suggestion here. That was great advice. That um, it, that's nice because I that's what I tell students <laughs> to do. I'd say I suggest to them to build a portfolio, and I try to describe them. And um, it often comes down to starting with a GitHub repo. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's that's the first thing. Like I. I get so excited when someone sends me a resume and then there is a link to some project in the GitHub and then I can see. And I'm like, okay, this saves a lot of my time and my and, and I enjoy seeing it, right? Yeah. So because resume can only tell a very small story. So the more you can provide, the better. I agree. Um, okay, we have another question. Have you encountered resistance slash bias while uh, growing our ladies? Can you comment specifically on some such challenges and how you overcame them? Yes, I'm, I'm nodding and laughing because yes, all the time, every day, uh, nonstop. Uh, <laughs> so, so many, so many, like we like, why do you need this type of group? Are you excluding people? Why are you excluding people? Uh, we don't need this type of group. Uh, there is there is no reason. L like and and then there would be some jokes and uh, like jokes around. Like for example, oh, there is our ladies. Now I'm going to create our guys. Or there is a ladies. Now I'm going to create our blah blah blah. So how do uh, how do you overcome? You got to a point where you just like you know you are there you are in the spotlight so and especially myself i was in the spotlight all the time in front of our ladies so things would come to me very often because i was the face and you know i you have to get to a point where don't bother anymore because that's that's going to take all your energy 
So uh, also find allies that can help you, uh, you know, uh, overcoming as well and supporting you as well as a group, as a person. It's so important to have allies, people that are on your side, especially when there are some attacks, resistance, bias, and all those things. So having this group that is behind you and with you, it's so important. Good advice. Um, so you mentioned a few um, during your talk, but what are some tips to attract more co-organizers co for chapters to ensure continuity and reduce chapter dormancy? Well, it is so hard, so hard. Uh, let me talk about San Francisco. So San Francisco, you can think that there is a lot of people. We are in the hub here. And it is so hard to find organizers. So, so, so hard. And I would mention why. One is because people move all the time. We don't see people staying in the same region for a long period of time especially here in the Bay Area. The second one is around events, meetups. There are so many, so many. Uh, so it's hard to find someone that wants to commit and take ownership and responsibility. So then what would be my advice is try to find people that is as committed as you are. Again, going back to the being passionate about, but I don't think it's an easy task. And then the other, the flip side is, if you have our latest chapter that it's close to a university, there is the same problem. People will graduate and then they will leave the chapter because they will graduate and move. Um, so it's, it's, I would say it's very, very hard. So it's a, it's a constant looking around, finding people to take over um, the chapter and to help you um, organizing it. Just kind of following up on that, I'm curious, how many chapters have you um, had a chance to visit either virtually or in person? I mean, if you had to like quantify, is it like in the dozens or? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I would say that. around, I would say around 20. 20, wow, okay. Yeah. That's still quite a bit, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, like, like, in person, in person, I would say less than 10, but virtually, yeah, with 20, 30 that I presented. Like sometimes I like to do this now that it's everything's virtual. Uh, and, and so I have all the events uh, on the meetup.com list. Sometimes I go and jump to some meetups and just to see what is happening i love doing that and then i say hey this is awesome and so i do go around uh, some of meetups because i want to see what people are talking about i want to support them uh, so I, I also try to do that i'm not speaking per se but i'm there watching hmm. that makes sense um a question by the way but by, by the way so yeah i was one day uh, i went to our ladies baltimore um and i forgot her name i'm i'm so bad with names and she she's from um, the uh, University of Vancouver, so British British Columbia. Tiffany Timbers. Tiffany, yes. And then she was like about reticulate. So I joined that event. You did? I did. Yeah, you weren't there. You weren't there. I guess. I, yes. It, there was a snowstorm. It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> that, that's really cool, though. Um, Question for Martin Morgan. Is it about forming a community within a community or advocacy? And then nothing about me without me, question mark. Oh, my God. That's a great question. It is a community within the community, and we all are community. It is advocacy as well. It is nothing about me without me also. I would say it's all of them. I, I don't know even how to start answering this question, but it is a community within the community and within the community, there is a community. So we all, um, you know, there is a lot of intersection. We all work together and there is no, so let's go back to the open source. So to an open source, for our open source projects to be successful, they have to have a community around no matter what. All the open source projects that you see that have successful 
they have a community around. Yeah, I've noticed that, yeah. It's a very good question though. Um, okay, another question from Adine. Thinking about the vast number of Our Ladies chapters, is it possible to federate the lessons to make it easier for local users? I was thinking of combining a virtual lesson, um, but a local meetup watch, with local meetup watch parties, kind of a group taking a course together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there is a lot of lessons shared within chapters like best practices or like things that worked for one chapter. So they share what are the, the lessons learned. And also, uh, so it's sh we share across chapters this. Um, but a virtual lesson, but local meetup. That would be fantastic what you're saying. So let me, from what I understand, you, you are thinking about this. So you are going to do a virtual lesson and then you have the local meetups joining the lesson. Kind of like what we do with use our so you have the use our happening and you have satellites events or watch parties happening uh that that is a fantastic idea and a lot of chapters do take courses together so one of the first meetups events or series of events that we did in our ladies at our lady san francisco uh was to take uh roger rogers coursera intro to our programming or our programming it was the only course that we had in coursera about our back in the day we took the whole class together like each saturday we would get together watch the lectures and then we would stop if anyone had a question we would pause the video and then someone would go to the whiteboard and explain what was happening so it was so helpful it was one of the the times that i learned the most so that's something very, very interesting and cool to do. Hmm. Agreed. Uh, all right. Are there other questions for Gabriella? I feel like I've dominated the conversation. <laughs> all right. Um, well, if not, another round of applause. Um, Thank you so much for uh, Adina saying thank you so much for your contributions to R and everything you've done to make this community more inclusive. I can just speak personally how influential you've been uh, for me um, joining our community. So thank you and thank you for taking the time to give this beautiful talk today. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Take Get care. in touch. <laughs> Bye. Bye.